So as Steve mentioned, I am making a broad assumption that most of you are fairly aware of the previous work that I've done, um, particularly around the issue of coral bleaching and then with the work that I did with um, Chasing Coral, the Netflix film. Um, Chasing Coral is a really cool project because basically every facet of the project actually started in Boulder. So the production company <laughs> Exposure Labs is, um, is based in, in your guys' neck of the woods. Um, as well as the company View Into the Blue that made the cameras that you guys actually see being used for the time lapses. Um, so deep, deep roots to boulder all around in terms of the Chasing Coral film. Um, but just to start, the, the gist of the work that we were doing, um, I guess this is going all the way back to starting at the end of 2013, was we had this concept of taking uh, the quintessential coral reef, kind of as you see here, um, incredibly diverse, colorful, um, this amazing place that all of us as divers have come to know it and enjoy. And the idea was to document ecosystems like this, going through their transition to being bleached. Um, and the film actually just started with the concept of let's take nice color for coral reefs and visualize them changing into what you're seeing here in a bleached landscape. And where it ended up um, was actually ultimately following this entire transition to where you end up with a reef that looks like this. Um, completely decimated. Um, in some of the places that I've worked, I've seen a nearly 100% coral mortality, um, particularly in the northern section of the Great Barrier Reef where we did extensive work for um, chasing coral. Um, but that was the concept, right? Um, and just to put this into perspective, um, going back to 2016 when the major bleaching was occurring, um, on the left you're seeing um, essentially the diagram of what that bleaching episode looked like throughout the sectors of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, in the north, we had extreme, extreme degradation, uh, but thankfully the southern and central portions um, were impacted as badly in 2016. Um, and for anybody that by chance hasn't seen the film um, or didn't know what you were getting into and in coming to this talk today, um, this is just kind of a little snippet from the film um, where you can visualize um, essentially what we did with the time lapse. So, um, this is a, a 56 lo uh, day long time lapse starting when the, the reef was bleached. Um, and basically we're watching it transition to where um, we're seeing mortality occurring. Um, and then essentially that phase shift or a shift from coral coverage to uh, mostly algal coverage. And as you can see there at the end, um, in this particular snippet, we're probably looking at, at the range of 90, 85% coral mortality, um, just within view of this camera. But Overall, um, at Lizard Island, where that little snippet was taken, um, by the end of the summer in 2016, um, in, down there, we looked at about 95 to 98% coral mortality. Um, so super devastating stuff. Um, you know, really emotional to be involved with, to kind of experience these amazing places that you dream about exploring when, when you're growing up and as a diver. Um, and basically going there and experiencing them at their, their worst moments. Um, but this wasn't just Australia. Um, this is something that in 2015 through 2017 um, was occurring worldwide. And in any of my talks, I always make it a point to show this image. So this is a, basically a conglomerate of sea, uh, sea surface temperature anomalies. Um, and what that means is you're looking at areas of our ocean that were abnormally warm over that kind of three year stretch. Um, and really the takeaway of why I show this is that you can look as much as you want and zoom in or however you wanna go about it. What you'll see is that under no circumstances anywhere on the planet, tropical or Arctic, there was no location in which there was no stress that occurred over that three, period, um, three year period of time. Basically any coral anywhere in the world over um, 2015 through 2017 was reaching a, a stage where bleaching was either um, you know, likely or eminent. Um, and because of that, we saw massive bleaching at a global scale in 2016. Um, and we saw large scale mortality across the board. It was not something that was just limited to Northern Australia, uh, but this was occurring all over the planet. Now, I certainly um, would love to take questions um, at the end. So I'm gonna skip through some of that. And if there are questions about chasing coral um, or just simply about bleaching um, four or five years ago, 
uh, we can leave that for the end, but I want to transition us towards talking about this issue um, in, in more of our current timing, um, because as we've been dealing with the global pandemic, um, you know, these processes and bleaching itself hasn't necessarily slowed down. It has certainly been brushed under the rug more so than it was in 2016, because we're, we're very busy with a, a world of a lot of craziness right now. Um, but unfortunately, the bleaching that we documented in 2016 wasn't the, the, the full story. Um, in fact, in 2017, that central section of the Great Barrier Reef bleached. Um, it's one of the first recorded back-to-back -back years of bleaching to be um, documented on the Great Barrier Reef, and it was pretty extensive. Um, I believe in the film, we utilized the number 29 to 31% of corals um, had died across the Great Barrier Reef in 2016. What you don't hear about in the film is that if you include 2017, that number essentially jumps to 50%. So in two years, 50% of the corals within the Great Barrier Reef um, had died. Now, I wanna emphasize as well that 50% is an extremely scary number. It comes off as extremely doom and gloom. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. There are still incredibly amazing spots in Australia to dive. Um, I was actually part of the, the team that did the first assessment on the far north um, after the 2017 bleaching event. And essentially, you can actually see, and I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, um, but in 2016 and in 2017, these outer bands of the, the Great Barrier Reef actually were remarkably still intact. And so when we did our assessment in 2017, we were able to see that although this interior section, the inward reefs were for the most part decimated, this exterior portion, whether um, the causality was because it has access to cooler water from the Coral Sea um, or other hydrodynamic reasons, those reefs are actually remarkably intact. And if we, um, if, if you think back to the slide that I opened with, that's actually a reef that we've done a bunch of research on now. Um, and we actually think that even after 2016 and 2017, that reef is potentially one of the most diverse um, coral reefs on the entirety of the Great Barrier Reef in, ter in terms of coral coverage. So there's still gems out there, but this is still an incredibly important um, important topic to at least be aware of it and to talk about, especially as divers, because we're the people that actually get to see and experience these things. And I think it's a good thing to be educated and understand what you're seeing. Um, but rant over and complete tangent to where I was going with this. Um, in 2020, we actually had significant bleaching once again. Um, this was occurring basically throughout um, February and uh, March. And this time it actually hit the southern sector, which is more worrisome um, because essentially what we're seeing in the past four years, we've had significant bleaching events in all three major sectors of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and we can basically um, derive from that also that these things are getting more frequent, right? The last time that we've seen massive bleaching at this scale um, would have been in the El Nino year of 1998. So, it's scary stuff. And again, it's not actually just occurring in Australia. Um, so this is actually a photograph that was taken in, um, in mid-May. Um, and this is from Tahiti and Morea. Um, we had bleaching that was quite significant this year in French Polynesia that uh, most people probably weren't aware of and weren't hearing about. And then just recently, a month ago, or I guess two months ago, um, we actually had massive bleaching in um, the southern, southeast part, parts of Asia, particularly in Taiwan. Um, so there was incredible imagery of um, extremely diverse reefs in Taiwan coming out where they had extreme mortality once again. Um, so just want to point out that um, you know the project that we started in 2016 obviously ended up in a film, but the work and the emphasis that's being done on coral bleaching and our ability to monitor and understand how this is altering seascapes and coral reefs around the world is an ongoing process and, and these events are continually popping up um, and their frequency is just continuing to get worse and worse. So coral reefs are in a really troubling position and um, yeah, it's just a shame. We, we certainly need to you know, do everything on our power as individuals to, to try and limit exactly what's going on here. Um, and then just to take it one more step further, this is um, from the NOAA's Coral Reef Watch, um, which is totally open access. If you are interested, you can go there and um, scroll through quite a lot of data. Uh, but this is pulled down from this morning. 
Um, and you may have also heard that Belize has had some large scale bleaching over the past month or so. Um, and based on this, we are likely seeing bleaching in, in the ABC islands, um, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao. Um, I haven't seen any reports out of there as far as I'm aware of, um, but it's certainly uh, not a great time to be in the Southern Caribbean based on the projections um, of bleaching currently. So um, these are all still ongoing problems. Now on to what I've been doing since the film. Um, so as Steve mentioned, I recently moved on from working with the film and doing educational outreach on kind of coral reef science and oceanic science um, and moved that into doing more science of my own. Um, so I am now in a doctorate program at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is owned and run by the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and I work for Elizabeth Madden um, in her lab. And our goals are largely focused on large-scale coral reef ecology, um, but also a, a fundamental focus on utilizing innovative technologies to accomplish our goals in terms of um, remote monitoring and, and ecological monitoring. Um, so my project right now, um, what I'm gonna be working on for my PhD is this concept of halos um, that occur on reefs. They're super fascinating um, because they occur all over the world. Um, and our understanding of them, like we have a baseline, uh, we understand why they occur, but we don't understand the mechanisms and understanding those mechanisms are actually um, really interesting because if our hunches are correct, they could largely become fantastic indicators of reef health. Um, so I just wanna briefly explain why we think these halos are occurring and essentially go through um, why we're trying to work on them and their potential applications for things like conservation and ideally in the long term, potentially um, increasing our understanding of bleaching. Um, so if we think about any underwater ecosystem, um, there's always going to be predator prey interactions. And so the coral reef as we know it is essentially um, this mechanism for protection for coral reef fishes. We all know this as divers, uh, when you're on a reef, there are incredible structural components that essentially increase habitat for the massive diversity of fish that we see on coral reefs. Now, herbivores on these reefs, um, they're protected largely when they're on the reef. And so for the most part, they're going to devour any form of vegetation, any form of algae that exists on a reef, given that the, the density of the population of herbivores is enough to do so. When that reef is cleaned thoroughly, they now have to venture off. And um, in many cases, there's seagrass directly next to the reef. And what we're seeing here is actually these populations of herbivores are extending out as far as they feel safe to do so. And they clear away that algae or seagrass or whatever it may be, and leave behind this pattern of a halo that can be seen from satellite imagery. As they go farther away, their chances or their probability of being consumed or eaten um, by a predator increases so dramatically that we can actually see the threshold at which a fish is no longer willing to go farther and graze or spend time feeding. Um, and this is really interesting because it can um, not only give us insights into things like overfishing, right? If there's going to be overfishing of the predators, then we could actually see an expansion of the halo. The halo is gonna get a little bit larger. The herbivores are taking in that information and essentially making a decision, hey, I think we can push it a little bit farther for our meal today. And therefore the satellite imagery is gonna show these um, halos expanding. Similarly, if there's overfishing per se on, um, on the herbivores or there was an increase of um, the predators, we could actually see them shrink. And so there's this um, mechanism that's going on here that's shrinking, expanding, and in some cases, even just forming these halos. Um, and our idea is that we want to understand exactly what those species interactions are doing. Um, and that's what I was hired to do. Um, and basically what I'll be doing, which I'll talk about more in the next slide, is setting up mesocosms to experiment on exactly what those predator-prey interactions look like and how they're gonna impact the reef and the patterns around them. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead to this photo just to give you guys an idea of what our research is going to look like. Um, 
these circles, the colors are completely irrelevant. Um, so you can go ahead and ignore the, the pretty colors there. Um, but the idea right now is that we're going to set up 12 mesocosms. Um, and by mesocosms, I essentially mean a giant aquarium that, unlike aquariums in Denver, um, they're going to actually be within the, the water column of the ocean on these platforms that you see. Um, and within these large scale mesocosms, we're going to have a structure in the middle that will replicate that kind of balmy or coral reef. And then we'll have different densities of predators and different densities of herbivores inside them. And then over time, we're going to measure how those densities ultimately impact the size um, or the shape um, or the formation of halos within that. So there will be assays of algae, basically as like spokes coming away from a center point. Um, and we're going to basically allow these to live out their uh, their time and then measure how those um, algal patterns around that center structural point um, are going to change. But ultimately what our goal here is, is that many of these places around the world, um, and in my case here in Hawaii, really remote reefs are extremely expensive to do hardcore research on, um, let alone even just to dive on. Um, so places like the Northwest um, Hawaiian Islands, places like Midway, where we get one large boat out to those um, that archipelago once a year, maybe every two years, and we're, it's extremely time limited. We have um, particular projects that have to be done, and we can't be there at all periods of time, unlike places like um, like my office at Coconut Island in Kaneohe Bay, um, or Lizard Island, or Orpheus. Um, some of these research stations have direct access to coral reefs and year-round monitoring. So if halos do end up providing us enough information to make guesses about what's occurring on a reef, whether it's predators or something like bleaching, we can use satellite imagery to make estimations and use uh, reef halos as indicators for stresses and disturbances going on on coral reefs. And it would first and foremost decrease the cost of this type of research immensely. Um, and then we can pair our, um, our ability and manpower when we do have opportunities to be there um, to have better questions and better priorities when we have those opportunities opportunities based on the information that we can derive from satellite images and vegetation patterns around coral reefs. Um, so potentially it could be a, a massive breakthrough in terms of conservation application um, and our ability to work on remote reefs that are just incredibly challenging to get to, um, and in some cases impossible to work at. Um, so that's the gist of what I'm up to now. Um, I think it's super interesting, the applications and, and the technological perspective of it. Um, and that is kind of my backstory and where I'm at. Um, but I think that I've left more than enough time. Yeah, I cruised through. Um, so we've got like 40 minutes. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about chasing coral and, and the bleaching phenomenon. Um, and if anybody has interest in the current research that's being done at HIMB, um, I'm more than happy to speak about that um, to the best I can. I've only been here going on two and a half months or so. So I, I, it's still very rudimentary and uh, I'm still getting my feet wet, but um, yeah, happy to take some questions and thanks for, for putting up with a handful of slides. Getting your feet wet. That was good, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, if you have questions, you can use the uh, chat button at the bottom of your screen and fire them off to us. But I have a list myself that I made. <laughs> um, yeah, how do I pull up the, I'm just going to try and get the chat open. I don't know if I can actually do that. So what? Zach, we have it set up such that we get the chats and then we'll kind of go through them and present them to you. Word right on, that works well for me. Well, I'll keep the pretty pictures up then. Perfect. Um, so a couple questions that come to mind when you talk about the uh, herbivores, can you give us an example of, of specific fish that are herbivores? Yeah, for sure. So in my study experiment, I am Still working it out, but it's basically come down to two different species for me. Um, so I'm going to be using either um, juvenile bullethead parrotfish. Um, so parrotfish are, are massive herbivores around, around coral reef ecosystems. They're incredibly important in terms of the Caribbean. 
Um, they're also extremely clumsy. So parrotfish have beaks, uh, as you probably know. Um, and essentially, when they're going out for algae, they're not very um, they're not very careful in just getting algae. They can actually be quite destructive in terms of um, them picking up pieces of coral as well. So actually, in this photo that you're seeing with a parrotfish, they'd come in and just take a big chomp out of that patch of algae right now. But they'd actually probably also take a little bit of this coral. Um, and funny enough, that's actually why parrotfish essentially poop sand, um, because they are taking little chunks out of coral as well while they eat algae. Um, they digest that, and the, the pieces of the, the calcium carbonate skeleton of the coral, um, as it gets digested, essentially just gets come out the other side of sand. So um, next time you're on your dive trip and having a, a drink on, on the beach afterwards, just remember that some of that beach is parrotfish poo. Um, but the variety of, of herbivores is quite large. Um, tangs are probably the most important, um, or surgeon fish. Um, so one of my other candidates for, for our particular study is gonna be the Tamini tang. Um, one of the smaller species that um, you're gonna see throughout all reefs um, globally. Um, and they're basically constantly grazing. And you do see them in, in large schools that basically will go through a, a reef and just rip through algae. So you can see hundreds um, come through and just decimate all algae within kind of a, I don't know, 10 by 10 square meter area and um, move on to the next area with algae. So those are probably the two major ones that, that come to mind, but um, there's certainly more. So one of the questions I had was, um, my understanding of bleaching is that it, it isn't necessarily um, imminent, I guess, that the coral is gonna die. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the distance between bleaching and dead coral? Yeah, totally. So bleaching, I think, historically has gotten kind of a bad rap because the word has almost become synonymous for more people of death, um, and that's not actually the case. Um, so when we think about a coral, just to go into like the basic biology of what's happening with bleaching, when we look at these and we see these different colors, the coral itself, are all actually transparent. The colors that we're seeing are small algal cells called zooxanthellae um, that live within their tissue. And those zooxanthellae photosynthesize. Um, when I work with children, I, I use the analogy of, um, if we were all corals, essentially we would all be green, we would have um, algae inside of our skin. And rather than going to the cafeteria for our lunch, we would all go outside and sunbathe. And that energy from the sun would give us the energy to grow big and strong. Um, corals essentially function the same way. However, there's a catch. Um, these algae, while they're pro producing essentially food or nutrients for the coral when temperatures are normal, when temperatures get too warm, these algae start to essentially misbehave. Um, rather than producing food or nutrients for the coral, they start producing what are called reactive oxygen species, um, or essentially just really nasty molecules that can do a lot of harm to the corals, um, to the coral cell. Um, and the coral recognizes this. So the coral says, I've got something inside my cell that's doing me significant damage and I will die if I don't get rid of it. So they actually get rid of all of this algae, leave behind their transparent tissue. And through that tissue, you can see the bright white skeletons underneath. And we call that bleaching. Now that coral is still alive. It just has now lost its main energy source, its source of food, um, and it can still survive. If the temperature um, comes down remarkably quickly, the coral is just going to retake those symbionts or those zooxanthellae, uh, and they'll be stressed out for a period of time. There are corals that survive bleaching tend to not grow a whole lot for about a year. They tend to not reproduce the next reproductive session, uh, but they did survive and, and they do make a rebound. Where it gets bad is um, based upon something that we call degree heating weeks. And that's just a fancy word for how long is it too hot? Um, so as the weeks continue to go by where you're too warm for the corals, and when I say too warm, it's two degrees Celsius above their normal. So everywhere in the world, this is gonna be different. Um, in the Keppel Islands in Australia, normal is 28 degrees. So 30 is going to kill them or bleach them. Um, however, in the Red Sea, 31 can be normal. Um, so 33 degrees is when stress is gonna to happen to them. If that two degrees Celsius above normal lasts a month or more, 
um, that's when we start to see really high mortality and high death. Um, but every coral is a little bit different. Um, this image that's up on the screen right now is, is actually a, a really good way to look at it um, because these corals on top of, this is actually a large body. This is one of my favorite corals in the world. Um, it's about 2000 years old. It's the size of a, a small house. Um, it's about 30 feet tall uh, by 40 feet wide. And these corals on the top are all acroporids, um, a couple psilloporids, that's all beyond the point. But essentially, um, these corals on top are really likely to bleach. Um, if you get up to a month of, of warm temperatures, the vast majority of species on top of this large parietes coral are going to die. Uh, however, the parietes coral is extremely tough. Um, they take a lot more time, probably on the scale of two months um, or even more, for them to even begin to bleach, let alone die. So you see fairly low mortality um, in kind of these large boulder type corals um, in comparison to a lot of the branching species. Um, branching species tend to bleach really quickly and die very easily. But on the flip side of that, the branching corals are actually the, the species that are kind of the, the weeds and the grasses. They're the ones that come back remarkably quickly. They grow remarkably quickly. Um, if we think about it, put it in the perspective of a wildfire, which you guys are dealing with at this point. Um, if we think about the wildfire burning as the equivalent of a coral bleaching event with high mortality, um, after the wildfire, the grasses are going to come back first, aka these branching corals. Then we're going to start getting shrubs, which could be some of the brain, some of the, the smaller corals. Um, and then eventually you're going to get those big, tall, standing, long-lived trees, which would be these large bombies of um, boulder corals, things like parietes um, or star coral in the Caribbean. Um, so it works similarly to that, a kind of a succession of species. Um, but really the point there is that the the species that die the easiest are also the ones that come back the quickest. That's awesome. That explains a lot. In the, in the film Chasing Coral, you talk a little bit towards the end of the film about super corals. Can yep. you uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So um, Ruth Gates, who um, used to actually be the director of um, the institute that I'm at now, the Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology, uh, before she passed away in uh, a few years back. Um, she was really one of the, the influencers on this idea. And um, the idea is actually quite simple when, when you cut it down. It is essentially saying that rather than just taking corals and replanting them in places, we can begin now with technological advancements in sciences to really look into genetics and to, into the genome. Um, and what we're able to do is take corals with lots of different genomes. And like in a laboratory setting, we can place them into situations that might resemble what we think oceans will look like in 2050 or 2100. And we can look at survivalship of those genotypes and selectively pick them out as candidates to be used in restoration projects um, and to be used further in testing their resilience to heat waves or even things like ocean acidification. Um, now, one of the things that I've personally done, um, I mentioned that I, I did one of the first surveys and assessments of the Northern Great Barrier Reef um, in 2017 after mass bleaching. And one of our goals with our team um, was to go out and we actually were actively searching for one particular species um, that seemed to fare better. Um, we found lots of surviving colonies of one species, um, particularly Acropora tenuis. Um, and then secondarily, to go to these really degraded reefs, I showed an image, um, I think the third slide of just a reef that was decimated. Um, and essentially go through, let me actually pull that up so we can look at it. So to go on to a reef that looks something like this and to collect surviving colonies. And if you look really closely and have an eye for it, you can see right here, for instance, is a small colony that looks like it has survived the bleaching of there. And what we can do is collect colonies like that one, bring it back to a laboratory, and with all of the colonies that we were able to collect that survived, we can force them to breed with each other. The idea being if mom and dad both survived, there should be some inherent genetic factor at play that allowed them to do so. And if we're lucky, they're going to pass that along to their offspring, and we're going to create genotypes that um, 
that might possibly fare better during a, a bleaching event or a, a high stress event. Um, so that's essentially what we're talking about when we talk about super corals is um, really beginning to look into the genetics um, and try and figure out what's going to work best for them. Um, but it's complicated too, because you have to remember with corals, they're not like you and me where we have our genes. Um, with a coral, the coral has their genes, but their algae has their own genes. So there's a handshake there, which is which is complicated. Um, so there are there are some algaes that we know already are more thermally tolerant and are going to allow corals to do better. Um, but they have trade-offs. Those particular algaes that allow corals to survive high heat, those corals across the board, whether or not it gets hot, have significantly lower growth rates um, all the time. So it's um, this trade-off of would you rather potentially be dead or would you rather be alive and not really be able to grow? Um, being alive is always better, uh, but it's still a trade-off that we have to consider. So um, that's the gist of it, but there's a, a lot going on and, and the work in genetics, which isn't necessarily my strong point or what I work on, um, is just rapidly moving um, with the advent of things like CRISPR and um, gene editing tools. Uh, the door is being slowly kicked wide open um, to really being able to do some interesting stuff in terms of genetics and coral reefs. A question that came in from our, our uh, one of our viewers um, is it seems like there's a lot of focus on um, elkhorn and staghorn species being restored in, in um, a lot of different areas. Uh, does that cause any concern to you that those are the only species that seem to be uh, focused on right now? Yeah, so it's twofold. Um, I do think it's concerning. I, my personal opinion in terms of successful restoration, in terms of um, like recreating a, a functional ecosystem, um, look, the, to just be straight to the point, corals are in a lot of trouble. Um, and we're going to lose a massive amount of corals by 2050. I mean, some projections show 90% of corals worldwide um, will largely be gone by 2050. I, I, we can have optimism that that largely won't be the case. Uh, but in many places, we're going to see extreme damage. Um, and like I said, the damage that occurs there is going to happen first on species like that. Um, that's why they're endangered in the first place. Um, I think that over the next 10 years or 20 years, we're going to begin to see a shift of acceptance that that might be the way that it goes and shifting our responsibility in terms of restoration and protecting the species that have the best opportunities um, at survival moving forward. Um, so while I think it's noble and we certainly need to hold on to genetic material and have areas where those species are going to flourish so that we don't make them go extinct, um, at a broad scale in terms of protecting large scale environments, um, I think the focus is largely going to drift away from um, endangered species and into um, species that we know are going to be the best viable option for a functional ecosystem into the future. Uh, that being said, restoration as a whole kind of has a problem because um, without what we just talked about, without looking at genetics, many restoration opportunities are folks finding a reef that looks like this, and just taking coral and planting them there. Um, a reef that looks like this and just planting corals there, the same thing is gonna ultimately happen again. If we're not looking at genetics and we're not placing the best genotypes or the best corals back, um, that to me seems like a waste of money and a waste of our resources. Um, we have to do the best that we can. However, at a localized to scale, particularly in places like the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, um, I, I've been lucky enough to work in places all over the world. And one of the most surprising things to me is you go to these places that have incredible ecosystems just underneath the, the ocean right off of their shores. And a lot of people in um, developing countries just simply don't necessarily have a relationship with that or don't spend any time in the water. Um, and so, in, in the case of education, I think that restoration projects working on any type of coral, whether it's um, Cervicornis or Palmata, um, they have incredible um, outcomes in terms of education amongst, um, amongst communities that really need an understanding of what's going on in their own backyards um, in an ecosystem that's difficult to, um, 
to experience for, for many people around the world. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think that work going on on those particular species is incredibly useful because not only are you um, creating and propagating a species that is um, incredibly endangered, but you're doing so in a position where you're creating community engagement and you're educating um, the people that actually need that education and to be doing that work the most. Because um, as much as we want to talk about um, you know, coral restoration and coral bleaching um, in the United States, you really can only do it in the Keys and, and in Hawaii. Um, you know, everybody else, if you're not a diver, it's not gonna be something that's hitting you close to home um, and skill sets relevant to coral restoration aren't gonna be that important to you. So we need to have a, a large focus on doing these in places like Belize and, and doing it in Indonesia and the Philippines um, and giving those tools and that education to the communities that can actually put it to work. Um, so that's a long drawn out answer, but um, short story is we should restore everything that we can. But when it comes to um, important decision making and making the best decisions for large scale ecosystems, um, I unfortunately am, am, am a proponent uh, of leaving the endangered ones behind. I think we're kind of at that point. One of our guests um, is concerned about your health with regards to uh, the amount of diving that you were doing uh, during the filming of Chasing Coral. She wonders if uh, the extreme diving that you were doing during that had any effect on your health. Did you ever have any issues with the bends or anything like that? I have never um, had issues like that. Um, I've never been bent. Um, I think really the biggest thing, like I, there, I'm sure that you've been on significantly more dives than I have. Um, I'm like at 300 or so, which is really not a whole lot in, in comparison to many people in, in my field who have thousands on thousands. Um, you know, there's always risk involved with diving. We all know that. Um, you know, if you're doing it throughout your entire life, I think the biggest one that, you know, everybody kind of ultimately runs into is we all have higher likelihood of losing our hearing at a younger age. But um, as far as that, my hearing's pretty solid uh, as of right now, at least for the time being. And uh, yeah, thankfully, uh, thankfully all has been good for me. I don't know who you're referring to when you're talking about bad hearing, but because <laughs> I didn't hear what you said, actually. But um, yeah, so I guess... One of the, the uh, ultimate questions is what can we do? I mean, what can people do to have a positive impact on coral reefs in the world? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, the biggest thing, I, I'm going to make the assumption that um, everybody in here is a diver. Um, we can do a lot more than most people, right? Um, if we're just going to focus on coral reefs, we are the select few in the world um, that spend time on them and, and have the, the opportunity to spend time underwater and create that relationship. Um, first and foremost, that relationship in itself is important because you're going to introduce other people to diving. You're going to introduce people to the knowledge that you have about um, an ecosystem that you love and, and have experience with. Um, and that spread of knowledge in itself is, is something big for an ecosystem like coral reefs um, because they are largely out of sight and out of mind for the, for the average person. Um, furthermore, as divers, um, you know, we're all, you guys are all lucky enough to be mostly doing recreational diving, and most of you have probably have cameras and, and have memories and are able to do that. So snapping pictures of ecosystems, especially when you see something that's wrong, um, whether that's disease or bleaching, um, it's incredibly useful to the scientific community. Um, there are plenty of things like Coral Watch, um, who's based out of Australia, but they have um, functioning here in, um, in the States. Um, you can do those types of assessments or just simple imagery and share that with uh, basically a global network of data collectors um, that's shared for scientists so that we can get a picture of everything around the world. Um, I joke that we can't Jane Goodall the oceans, right? Um, Jane Goodall had this opportunity where she basically just got to live amongst um, her research subject for tens of years um, and that's amazing and she was able to learn so much but we can't do that in the oceans you know at, we have two hours an hour each time we get to go down to do all of our work and then we have our surface intervals and all of this stuff and we don't we can't do it every day um, there's a lot of work that goes in behind it but there are divers in the water every day and we, if we get even a small percentage of, of those of us diving to 
um, play a small role and participate in a little bit of citizen science. Um, that's actually incredibly important, important from the scientific side of things. Um, the more the merrier. We need as much data as we can um, in a time where these ecosystems are changing as fast as they ever have. Um, so that's number one. Um, and then secondarily, right, the, the core of these issues largely comes down to our impact on the environment um, as a society. Um, I, I never blame the individual, right, but there are certainly things that we can do as individuals um, to make a difference. Um, in Boulder, um, you know, that's, we're, we're very lucky um, because we're, we live in a place where these things are foremost in our faces almost every waking moment, right? Um, we're very lucky to, to have grown up and to live in a place where, um, you know, the idea of being conscious and being environmentally friendly is kind of ingrained in our culture. Uh, but there's always better things to do. And I think that's the point is where you are and where you're from um, is going to be a different answer. There's no silver bullet. Um, the answer in Boulder is going to be different than the answer in Honolulu. Um, so I think it's just about identifying, um, you know, weaknesses and strengths at the community level, at the, the state level, at the federal level, at your household level, at a school level, um, and tackling those head on and, and doing whatever you can. And it doesn't have to be directly relevant to coral reefs. It's about um, taking care of your own ecosystem in your backyard, because ultimately everything's connected. Um, Kelly's got a question, and then I've got a couple more, and then we'll wrap up. Go yeah, we it. only have Zach for exactly an hour. He was able to work us in for 60 minutes. Uh, I, can, I can go a little bit longer, but I have uh -huh. a meeting. I don't want to make you late I, for I have a meeting in 45 minutes. <laughs> Gotta save the world, Zach. Uh, let's see, I actually have two questions. So one of them is, are you familiar with the amount of awareness in the US government? And if so, do you know what role they're playing to protect the oceans? Yeah, right. So it, it's an interesting question. Cause I, I'll bring back up that in terms of coral reefs, um, we just simply don't have the coral reefs in the United States for there to be massive emphasis, right? Um, there's certainly emphasis in the state of Hawaii and in the state of Florida. Um, and at the state level, there's certainly things constantly being passed, right? So in the case of the Keys, as well as the state of Hawaii, um, they've done things like banned, um, you know, non-reef safe sunscreen. Um, in Hawaii, we certainly have a little bit more legislature in terms of things like runoff, uh, and then obviously the, the advent of the massive marine park that covers the entirety of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, so that's a, that's a step from the federal government that basically shows that um, while nobody lives here, it has really no economical value to us, we will protect that, um, which makes sense because there's really no conflict of interest there. It's so remote, so difficult to get to and so expensive that um, we're not impacting anything from fishing or economics. Um, and then that makes it really worthy of protecting it and doing some good. On the other side of that, it, it becomes a lot more difficult in terms of just general oceans, right? Our current administration certainly um, not, not the most environmentally friendly way, any way you cut it in terms of um, opening up previous memorandums that were protecting um, large areas throughout the Atlantic or throughout Alaska in terms of drilling and oil. Um, which are my specialties and I don't understand, um, you know, the full scope of, of impact in terms of those things, but needless to say, um, any human interaction that, that poses negative threat, um, we should do our best to try and limit and balance. Um, we'll never be able to just remove everything. Um, but it, it's, um, it's probably a more interesting question to ask about like the Australian government, right? Um, that, that's a completely flip flop to where their economy essentially can run on the Great Barrier Reef, um, particularly in the state of Queensland. Um, they rely solely on tourism in, in that area, and then they rely solely on mining, two conflicting interests um, that are, that can be extremely contentious. So that's an interesting case study where you have pretty large scale denial across the board within the Australian government of anything that's going on on the Great Barrier Reef for the most part. Um, I suppose the 2016, the last four years has caused a little bit of a stir there and potentially moved us in a more progressive direction. Um, but it's still uh, still very contentious and an interesting case study there. Um, but yeah, it's tough. 
Um, it's a hard one. I don't know if that's actually like a really good answer. That's kind of just a, a ramble on notes that I see throughout there. Um, I can say that Chasing Coral was shown to uh, members of the Senate and the House. Uh, we showed it in front of the United Nations um, around World Oceans Day in, in 2017. Um, so we've gotten the film in front of people that are our leaders and, you know, have a say in, in um, our decision makers. So um, there is that. Awesome. I really appreciate have another it. one, Kelly? I have one more. Um, where to go? It seems like COVID has been a blessing for the oceans, not having divers on the reef every single day to the extent that they probably normally do. Have you seen or heard of any evidence of that or anything like fish life coming back, coral coming back, anything like that? Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of coral coming back, um, it's probably too early to say, right? It's a, a fairly long-term uh, process. In Australia, um, spawning season's just starting. Um, so whenever the full moon is happening in, in the next few weeks, um, we'll start seeing spawning down there. And, and that may give us an indication um, long-term. Um, but in terms of here in Hawaii, um, as Steve mentioned, Hanama Bay, um, which is this amazing place here on Oahu, um, that's extremely popular with tourists and snorkelers and divers alike, um, has been shut down since March. Um, and there's a couple different projects within um, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology looking at that impact. Um, it's a great opportunity for science to be able to take a location that was once seeing millions of people every year on its beaches and in its waters to now having basically a seven month period with no involvement whatsoever. Um, so there's been a couple um, articles written by faculty here, um, just talking about the, the baseline that we're seeing right now in terms of um, like abundance of fish. Um, in my laboratory in particular, and um, actually one of the things that I'll be doing later on, I've got to go to a meeting after this, and then I'll be basically identifying fish and counting the amount of fish um, in transect video um, segments for the rest of the night. That is part of a study that the goal is looking for um, it changes in fish behavior and particularly herbivory um, within Hanama Bay. So we've got transect lines set up throughout the entirety of, um, of the bay and have been doing um, video surveys um, basically every week since the onset of COVID and since it has been shut down. And so we're going to attempt to um, see, if anything, um, what behavior of a herbivory and amounts of fish um, have occurred within the bay. So should be super interesting. It could come up with nothing for all we know, um, but that's the idea. We've got all of this video and a big team of folks that are, uh, that are going through different transects every week. Um, and we're very far away from analysis. So um, maybe when that's all said and done, we can come back and, and answer that question. But um, it's certainly a, an amazing opportunity. Anytime there's a disturbance like that, um, that gets scientists itching to, to go figure out if they can set up a study to, to find something out. So uh, really exciting, but I think in terms of most of it, we're, it's gonna be a wait and see. One of our viewers is asking if you know anything about the bacteria or virus that's killing the reefs in Cozumel. Yeah, so it's not just Cozumel. Um, I don't, think that they actually have an identification for it yet. Um, as they stated, we don't even know if it's bacteria or virus. Um, it could be a fungus also, um, but it's everywhere at this point. So it, it, um, it's a problem throughout the Caribbean at, at, at this point. It's in the British Virgin Islands now, it's in the Bahamas, um, and it's also in the Keys pretty extensively. Um, it's certainly devastating. It moves extremely rapidly when it does infect a coral. Um, there are some teams in Florida, um, potentially at FIU or FAU, um, that are working on a bunch of stuff. There's a coral disease lab at one of those universities. I'm spacing on which. Um, but they've been developing um, different methodologies to try and stop it um, in terms of an infected coral. So they'll go down, find infected coral, and they put, like, this tent over the top of it. And then they, like, have these kind of, like, it's not an antibiotic, it's a probiotic um, mixture or solution that they kind of soak the coral in. Um, and they've also developed these like gels that they go down with and like put that over the infected edge to try and stop it. Um, so there's work going on about it. I personally do not know, um, you know, exactly what 
types of methods or, or what types of molecules they're using to do that work. Um, what I do know is that so far the best methodology um, for stopping it is to, to cut the dead coral off and to cut the infected area off and just stop it in its tracks right there, um, which is unfortunate and obviously not super viable underwater. But um, yeah, it, it's certainly devastating. Um, we see outbreaks like this from time to time in other organisms, um, right? Part of the reason why the Caribbean has been degraded so much over the past 50 years isn't necessarily because of bleaching. It's actually largely due to a massive outbreak that killed diagemus theurgens in the 80s. Um, we essentially wiped clean the herbivores in the Caribbean in the 80s and opened the door for algae to overtake a lot of reefs. Um, and it created an imbalance that is largely um, the causation for, for the decrease in coral coverage throughout the Caribbean. Um, so we do see these things. My, my hope is that um, you know, by some miracle, it would, uh, you know, work itself out. But um, yeah, you never know with corals. That it's, um, corals live life in the slow lane. They, they don't tend to, you know, have a virus just take over the population and then it just kind of work itself out or um, things that we've been talking about, herd immunity, things like that. Um, things work a little bit differently in the ocean, period. Uh, but they certainly work a little bit differently in a, uh, in a sessile organism like a coral. They can't escape, right? Hey, can I get you to put a pretty picture of coral back up real quick? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and on a good note. Um, someone asked, thank you. Someone asked about uh, whether or not you have any social media accounts that they can follow to see what you're working on and, and things. Um, yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram, and it's at Zach Rapora. At Zach so Z A C K O R. Wait, hold on now. Hold on, I screwed that up. Z A C K R O P O R A. Acropora, but instead of Ac, it's Zach. Cute. <laughs> um, well, thanks, Zach. I really appreciate it, your time and your knowledge. I mean, you just never cease to amaze me with not only with your knowledge but with your passion for coral reefs, which is, we need more people like you out there. Um, I know there are more people like you out there, but we even need more um, that are doing this kind of work and uh, focusing on the, uh, the coral reefs of the world. Um, I just want to interject a couple of things real quick. Um, as you know, and may have, and as you mentioned, I've done a fair amount of diving in my life and still am doing a fair amount of diving, actually not within the last several months, unfortunately, but uh, I'm getting back to it. I'm going to St. Lucia in uh, two weeks, so I'm looking forward to that. But uh, there are a lot of places in the world that the coral reefs are still beautiful and very healthy, and uh, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, there are, definitely is a problem. Coral definitely is in trouble, and we definitely need to be aware of it and do everything that we can to protect it. But there are still a lot of places in the world, even as close as the Caribbean, that still have beautiful coral reefs. Um, and uh, sure. Bonaire of all places, uh, Bonaire is one of the only places, I, I mentioned actually at one point, we looked at that um, view with like all the red scary colors and Bonaire was in there. I just want to point out though that Bonaire never bleaches like there's really no historical record of ever bleaching especially during el nino years it's one of the only places in the world that during el nino years the abc islands don't actually get warmer they actually tend to get cooler and in la nina years they get slightly warmer but not enough to bleach them um so just following that the abc islands are freaking awesome it's amazing diving belize is awesome too glover's atoll is one of my favorite dives in the caribbean I always, I'm, I'm with you. I don't want to come across as being all doom and gloom. There's such amazing badass coral reefs that are just worthwhile all over the world. Get out there and dive. Yeah, let's talk about Indonesia, shall we? Shall we? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, but anyway, there are some great coral reefs. One of the things that I'm sure everybody's aware of by now is that they've discovered that, that most sunscreens have chemicals in them that are damaging to the reefs. So that's one thing we can we can do as divers is be aware of that 
and use reef safe sunscreens to not have a negative impact on the reefs when we're diving. Also controlling your buoyancy so that you're not damaging the reefs with your fins or other parts of your body. Um, obviously don't throw any crap in the water um, and uh, you know, be mindful of the environment that you're in and take care of that environment um, so that we can enjoy it for, uh, for time, for years to come. Um, my understanding too, Zach, just one last thing I wanna interject. Coral reefs are pretty resilient. Um, and it's my understanding that even though if we don't do something to protect our coral reefs more, we may see damage, like you say, in our lifetime, but coral reefs will, will regenerate. I mean, they will oh, for sure. one time. The sad part is it's just what's going to happen in our lifetime. And the fact that we have control over that right now, we have the control over it. And especially right now in our current political situation, we need to go out there and vote and vote for the candidate that you think is best prepared to protect the environment. Um, I'm not going to have an opinion about that, but because everyone has their own views and should do what they feel is right. But the most important thing is you need to vote. You need to get out there and vote for what you think is best for the environment, what you think is best for you. So I'm going to get off just to, just to briefly like touch on it, we didn't talk about it at all, but it's fascinating. And I do have plenty of time. So if you want to hang out and continue to talk about the resiliency of corals, go for it. If you guys have to leave, I'm going to hang around and talk about it because I think it's cool. Um, I briefly mentioned that spawning season in Australia is in the, coming up in the next few weeks. Um, but the resilience of corals is inherently they are the best um, reproducers in the ocean. They basically think about it as on one night, in one full moon, every single coral that you see in this image is going to throw its gametes into the water column. So we're talking about trillions and trillions of gametes, eggs, and sperm now can flow anywhere in the world. Um, and basically a reef that looks like this, that might be really close to a reef that looks like this, this reef will be replenished by these reefs if we hold our end of the bargain. We could kill 90% of the coral reefs, but that 10% would replenish the rest of the reefs around the world um, if we hold our end of the bargain. If we hold our end of the bargain fully, we, they'll replenish themselves in the next five years if there's no more bleaching. Um, they are amazing creatures that are literally designed to deal with these issues. It's just if we keep hitting them, hitting them, and hitting them, um, then yeah, in our lifetimes, it's gonna be a problem. But um, like you said, maybe in our lifetimes we do some damage, but corals will be fine long-term. Um, corals have been on this planet longer than plants have been on land. Um, 450 million years of coral, and they've been through five major mass extinctions, and the coral reefs in Australia and Indonesia have gone through 38 minor mass extinctions in the past 100 million years. They are so resilient and they continue to come back. Um, they're amazing creatures. And I'll just end that with one of my favorite quotes of nature knows no extinction, only perpetual transformation. <laughs>